All right. Um, so last class, we got halfway through showing something cool, and I want to finish it off this time. So just to um, recap briefly, we've been sort of poking at this connection between min-max theorems and no-regret learning algorithms. We've proven the min-max theorem using no-regret learning algorithms. In fact, you know, like we did so in a way such that the preconditions necessary for the min-max theorem are exactly the preconditions necessary for us to derive a no-regret learning algorithm. If you if you gave me a new no-regret learning algorithm that had weaker preconditions, I would have a, a, a stronger min-max theorem with weaker preconditions, um, which was interesting. And then last class, we started trying to sort of um, go in the reverse direction to really get this equivalence between min-max theorems and their regret learning algorithms, right? So, so you know, these, th these things are sort of the same object is going to be eventually the claim. If you give me, it's not just that if you give me a no regret learning algorithm, I can turn around and give you a min-max theorem. If you give me a min-max theorem, I can turn around and give you a no regret learning algorithm. And, oh, and, and we sort of, in fact, you want to do this in a constructive way, right? So, Min-max theorems, as stated, they're, they're these non-constructive objects. They sort of say, okay, if there's a max-min strategy um, achieving some value v, meaning, you know, if if the adversary goes first and and you can cook up a strategy for yourself, the minimization player to best respond that guarantees some value v, a min-max theorem tells you non-constructively. You know, there's a min-max theorem that does the same thing. There's a min-max strategy where you commit first and let the adversary best respond, uh, but it doesn't tell you what that strategy is. At least the statement of the theorem doesn't. Um, and so our goal, the thing we sort of set out to do last class and maybe got halfway through, was to try to build a constructive connection between min-max theorems and no-regret learning algorithms. Okay, so the idea is you give me a min-max theorem, I want to be able to extract from that not just an existential statement that there exist algorithms that have good no regret guarantees, but I want to be able to actually extract like algorithms, or practical or you know, polynomial time um, algorithms. Um, and you know, it's that second part actually. It's sort of trying to cook up this argument so that the result is actually constructive, so that we have an efficient algorithm at the end that is what introduces a lot of the complication, okay, a lot of the technical detail that we started to go through last time. Um, right, so it's maybe just to sort of recap from a bird's eye view, um, maybe the conceptually simplest kind of argument. This is maybe what I slightly misleadingly told you at the beginning of last class before we dived into the technical details, because this is sort of the conceptually simplest way to do it. But if you actually tried to do it this way, although you'd have to worry about fewer of the technical details that we started worrying about last time, you, you really would have sort of a non-constructive argument. The reason we're going through a little bit of additional algebraic pain is to have like an algorithm at the end of the day. OK, so just to sort of maybe remember the um, high-level idea that would give us a non-constructive argument, maybe reasonably directly, um, but but would sort of leave us thinking about how to get the actual algorithm. We sort of want to think about an interaction between a learner and an adversary over T rounds as sort of a gigantic zero-sum game. The learner's strategy space in principle is the set of all actions mapping transcripts to distributions over forecasts. Uh, the adversary's strategy space in principle is the set of all algorithms, once again, mapping transcripts to, well, we don't even have to say distributions over cost vectors, just cost vectors, because the cost vectors already form a convex space. 
and in principle, once you fix a, an algorithm for the learner and an algorithm for the adversary, this induces some distribution over transcripts. Once a transcript is realized, there's some regret that we can calculate for that transcript. And that can be our objective function. The learner wants to minimize regret. The adversary wants to maximize regret. And the basic idea would be, OK, well, you know, if the adversary goes first, if the adversary tells us their algorithm, then at any moment, at any, any round little t of the game, no matter what's happened thus far, um, we can just look at the algorithm. We can look at the adversary's algorithm. We can plug into it the transcript that's been realized so far. The adversary's algorithm tells us a cost vector that's going to be realized today. And, and what distribution of our actions should we play in response? Well, we should just deterministically play the action that corresponds to the adversary's cost vector, now known. Uh, yeah, the coordinate in which the cost is is minimized. Because if we do that, then round by round, we have no regret. In fact, we've played the best action uh, point-wise at each round. And so this objective we've set out for ourselves in the in the zero-sum game, the cumulative regret over time to the best fixed action, that'll be small. Um, and you know, that means the max min value of the game is small. And um, so the min max value of the game will be small. OK, that's sort of like a high level idea. Now, OK, the difficulty is that in this high level argument, we have defined a truly enormous zero sum game. The strategy space for the learner and the adversary are sort of the set of all algorithms, the set of all mappings from transcripts of length t to distributions over actions. So although you can cook things up so that everything is nice and convex, it's a really big zero-sum game. And it's not clear how you would solve this thing. Right? Like in principle, we've seen algorithms for coming up with equilibrium strategies in zero-sum games. But the running time of those, you know, they do things like run no regret algorithms over the space of actions. And here, the space of actions is huge. There's like one, one action for every algorithm. OK, so we could, we, we could sort of carry out this argument, but we wouldn't get an algorithm. Or you know, we, we would get the existence of an algorithm that perhaps could be found by solving an exponentially large linear program, but it would be hard to get our hands on it. And so just to sort of recall the strategy that we um, began laying out last time, which, which actually deviated a little bit from what I just described to you, the idea was not to define a zero-sum game over the entire strategy space of all possible algorithms. OK, the idea was to sort of take a local greedy perspective and say, we've got some loss. Okay, we, we care about our regret. And in fact, in order to make this next step tractable, we sort of um, gave a relaxation of our loss function. So just to recall, right? Like, what is regret? Well, regret is the maximum over all of our actions of our regret to action i, which is in turn the difference between our cumulative payoff, our cumulative cost, and the cumulative cost to action i. But the maximum is sort of like an annoying function. In particular, like the thing we want to argue in the next step um, of our derivation is that no matter what's happened so far, there's a distribution over actions we can play which will bound the increase, the sort of greedy you know, increment, the local increase in our loss. OK, now the increase in a maximum, it's sort of annoying because the max can be realized you know, at any of these k parts. There can be ties. Um, and so we, taught, we, we defined sort of an analytically nicer function called the soft max. Okay, and, and our surrogate, our softmax surrogate, rather than being the maximum over our regret terms to each of the action i, it was sort of like the softmax over our regret terms to each of the action i, which just meant it was the sum, rather than the max, the sum of the exponential of our regret to each of these actions i, with some 
some downweighting term eta, which you know suggestively named will eventually turn into like the learning rate and multiplicative weights. But why was this like a reasonable loss function to think about? Well, for two reasons. First, it's like a good proxy for the actual regret. We proved a lemma last time. We said, you know, if you take the log of the softmax surrogate and divide by eta, then this is an upper bound on regret. So if you can bound the softmax, you can bound the actual regret. And we also noticed it's actually a pretty tight upper bound in that it never exceeds the thing we want to bound by more than a log k over eta factor. So, um, you know, in some sense, if we, at least if we pick like modest values for eta, we're sort of, you know, the, the amounts that we're sort of going to be suboptimal at this step of the argument is you know, it's at most like logarithmic in the number of actions. Okay, so, so like, the first thing is that if we care about regret, it is reasonable for us to care about this thing. This is a very tight proxy to regret. Okay, but what, why, what do we get out of caring about this thing? Well, what we got out of caring about this thing is that when we looked at sort of an expression corresponding to um, the one round increase in the surrogate loss as a result of playing in this, you know, uh, expert learning game against an adversary for one additional round, right? If we sort of fixed the transcript in hindsight, uh, and then we said, okay, you know, suppose tomorrow I play action five and the adversary picks cost vector C, what will be my increase in regret? Well, that might've been a messy term, but the one round increase in my surrogate regret, it turned out we were able to upper bound that by a very clean expression. I mean, it had some constants floating around, but when I say clean expression, I mean something that was linear in the action of both the learner and the adversary. Okay, linear is nice because it satisfies the sort of um, concave convex conditions we need to apply a minimax theorem. And, and so what do we get from that? Like, why did we do that? Well, the reason we did that is so that we could define, rather than an enormous zero-sum game that we were going to min-max over, right? rather than an enormous zero-sum game where the learner's strategy space and the adversary's strategy space were the set of all algorithms, we did that so that we could define a different zero-sum game at each round. The zero-sum game at each round would be a small game. The learner's action space would just be the actions, you know, the K experts in the learning problem, not the set of all algorithms mapping history to uh, actions, but, but literally just the K actions at round T. Similarly, the adversary's actions wouldn't be the set of all algorithms mapping transcripts to cost vectors, but just the set of K dimensional cost vectors at day T, right? The, the, and the thing that this zero sum game is bounding is not the global regret over the whole sequence and expectation over the generation of this whole transcript, but just the one round increase in regret. That's really like the thing we're getting by thinking about this well-behaved function here. And the reason that's gonna be useful for us when we finish the derivation this class is because we can still carry out the min-max argument. Right, like because this is a tight upper bound on regret, what we're going to be able to do is derive the existence of a um, strategy for the learner. Just a, you know, at every round, so the strategy for the learner now is just a particular distribution over actions. Okay, a new one at each round that guarantees that the increase in surrogate loss is upper bounded by something modest, no matter what the adversary does. Okay, so if the increase in surrogate loss is always upper bounded in the worst case, then just by summing up over those increases over T rounds, we'll have that the overall loss is bounded and therefore the regret. But now when it comes time to like actually pin down the algorithm, the thing we need to do every day is play a min-max strategy for a modestly sized game. Okay, the kind of thing we can solve for efficiently. In fact, in this case, we're gonna get lucky and there's gonna be a nice closed form. But like even if we hadn't gotten lucky, we could use techniques we've already thought about to just compute the equilibrium efficiently. Okay, and when, as we sort of think about 
more complicated objectives using arguments in the same style in the future, we, we might sometimes have to resort to actually computing these equilibria using algorithms. And you know, it's going to be real convenient if, if they're um, if they're sort of modestly sized games. Okay, so that's sort of the the bird's eye view of, of the argument we started last time and we're going to finish today. Um, questions about the general plan of attack before we finish catching up to where we were last time and then continue. Okay. Next, I need to find my chalk. Aha. Okay, so we have this softmax surrogate function. And if you recall, we defined this quantity uh, corresponding to like the one round increase in the surrogate loss function as a function of both the action played by the learner and the cost vector played by the adversary. Okay, so um, we said that delta defined by the transcript as it exists at round s minus 1, given a particular one round continuation of the transcript given that, say, the adversary at round s plays cost vector c and the learner plays action i, we define this to be the loss, the softmax surrogate loss, for the hypothetical transcript that would exist if we continued the realized transcript for the first s minus 1 rounds with this hypothetical continuation of an action i for the learner and a cost vector c for the adversary minus the loss of the transcript as it exists so far. OK, so this quantity delta as a function of the outcome chosen today at round s is equal to the increase, exactly equal to the increase in this quantity that we've decided we cared about the surrogate that we're using for uh, regret. OK, our, our high-level goal is to find a strategy that guarantees that this thing is going to be small at every round. OK? Now, um, you know, this was some potentially complicated expression, but last time we proved an upper bound on this. OK? Just to remember that. What we proved is that, um, you know, if I if I want to upper bound this quantity, then it is enough to bound the following object: the sum over all of the experts of e to the eta times the regret to that expert times eta times the cost of expert i minus the cost of expert j, i being the action we actually played, j being the expert that we're comparing our regret to. Plus eta squared times the loss, the surrogate loss so far. OK. We, we sort of uh, did this last time. We proved this upper bound, which means that, you know, again, we want to guarantee that this thing is small. And so it would suffice to guarantee that this thing is small. And what is special about this thing, you know, it sort of maybe looks unwieldy at first, but um, it's extremely simple. 
So first of all, this term here, eta squared times the existing loss, that um, just doesn't depend at all on the actions played at the following rounds. This is just a, a constant that doesn't interact at all with the arguments. So to the extent that we're trying to find a distribution on actions such that for all cost for all cost vectors, this is small, we can just ignore this term. We can pretend this doesn't exist. And in a moment, when I write down the zero sum game, we're going to analyze that's what we're going to do. We're just going to ignore this term because it's independent of the actions of either player. And so payoff irrelevant. OK, so that's nice and simple. How about this term up here? Well, this sum matters. It does depend on the actions of uh, you know, both the learner that determines this index i and of the adversary that determines this cost vector c. Um, but the thing that looks messy about this, you know, this you know, unwieldy exponential term here with these regrets, that's again a fixed constant, right? Like that's a function only of the transcript up through yesterday. That's fixed. We can't affect that. Right, so that's just a constant multiplying the term that actually depends on the actions of the learner and the adversary. The only thing in this expression that depends on the actions at round s of the of the learner and the adversary is this ci minus cj. Okay, couldn't be simpler. Okay, so, so the key thing about this is that it is linear in c. It's linear in the action of the adversary, and when we allow the learner to randomize over actions, it's also going to be linear in the distribution um, of actions chosen by the learner. OK, that's what's relevant about this, because we're we're going to cook up a zero sum game as a function of this. We're going to need the minimax theorem to apply. We need the objective function to be convex, concave. This, this is going to fit the bill. So finally, getting to the definition that we left off with last time. The zero sum game that's going to drive our analysis. So the round T, softmax surrogate game. is defined by what? Well, we need an action space for the learner, an action space for the adversary, and a utility function. The action space for the learner, who will be the minimization player, is the distribution over these k actions, over the k x. It's a nice convex action space. The action space for the adversary, the maximization player, is the set of k-dimensional cost vectors. Nice convex action space. And, and again, these are objects of dimension only k, not like 2 to the t, as it would be if we tried to min-max over the whole of algorithm space. OK, so, so like. We have intentionally set up the problem by zooming in on the one round increase in surrogate loss so that at this moment we can define a zero sum game whose scale is k, the number of experts, not 2 to the t, the number of transcripts. OK, and then finally, for every cost vector belonging to the adversary, and for every distribution over actions belonging to the learner, the utility function in this zero-sum game is the expectation over an action drawn from the learner's distribution of the sum over all of the experts of e to the eta times the regret thus far to that expert 
times eta times ci minus cj. OK, exactly the first term in our upper bound on the increase in the surrogate loss. OK, why not the second term? Well, the second term is independent of the actions of either player. So if we find a min-max solution for the game corresponding to just the first term, that will also be a min-max solution to the game corresponding to two terms. Because if I add an action-independent constant to a utility function, it doesn't change the strategic properties of the game. OK? And this is a linear function in both players' actions. And so the, the, the min-max theorem applies to this game that we've defined. OK? Does this make sense? OK. So this is where we left off last time. OK. So for the rest of the class, I want to analyze this game. First, we're going to bound the max-min value of the game, which is going to be quite straightforward. That's what happens if the adversary tells us what they're going to do before we need to do it. Then we're going to apply the min-max theorem to derive um, the same bound on the min-max value of the game. That's how well, in principle, we can do with the best possible algorithm. At that point, we will have sort of, at least existentially, defined an algorithm where, what's the algorithm going to say? It's going to say, at every round, define this game and play a distribution over actions corresponding to a min-max equilibrium strategy of this game. That'll be, OK. A, even a constructive description of the algorithm because the game is small, but maybe not a super illuminating one. And then finally, we're going to observe that for this game, there's actually a, you know, like we don't have to like view it as a numeric optimization problem to find the min-max equilibrium. We can find a min-max equilibrium strategy in closed form. In, in fact, extremely simple closed form. OK, so we'll write down what that is, and we'll massage it a little bit, and we'll recognize it as something called the exponential weights distribution, very similar to the multiplicative weights uh, algorithm we already saw. OK. OK. The first claim is that um, the maximum value of the round t softmax surrogate game is, well, first of all, what does that even mean? It's the max min value. So it's the maximum over all of the adversary's strategies, over all vectors of, over all cost vectors the adversary could pick, of the minimum over the learner's strategies, so the minimum over all distributions on actions the learner could choose, of the utility we would guess, according to the utility function defined as part of the softmax surrogate game. And the claim is that this maximum value is at most 0. OK? So this is um, sort of a, a good game from the point of view of the learner. right? They're always able to guarantee value at most 0. They're trying to minimize the value, at least if they get to peek at what the adversary is going to do before the adversary does it. OK. How come? Oh. 
Well, let's put ourselves in the role of the learner. Okay, so the adversary first commits to a cost vector C, shows it to us. Now we have to best respond. What strategy P should we play? Well, you know, for any cost vector C that the adversary might tell us they're going to play, why don't we look at the coordinate that I'll call I star of C, which is just the coordinate in which C takes the smallest value. Okay, if there's ties, break them arbitrarily. Okay, take the first coordinate that is the minimum amongst all of the costs chosen by the adversary. So, um, you know, that's a coordinate. Let's let P star of C, the distribution that the learner can play in response, B, um, the distribution that places all of its weight on I star. Okay, so it's just like, let's call it E of I star, the I star, you know, like standard basis vector. It puts like weight one on the smallest coordinate of C, I star of C, and weight zero everywhere else. So it's not going to randomize at all. It's just going to deterministically pick the lowest cost action. OK, well, you know, then we know that for any C, U of C, P star of C, which is just, well, there's an expectation over the choice of I, but I is deterministically going to be I star of C in this case. So there's no, su uh, there's no sum over I. Okay, it's it's just the sum over j of all of these constants, e to the eta times the regret to action j times eta times c, the cost chosen by the adversary in coordinate I star of C minus the cost of action J. And the claim is that this is at most zero. How come? Well, these exponential terms, yeah, we don't know what these regrets are. These regrets could be positive or negative, but exponentials are, are non-negative functions. So you know, whatever this is, it's definitely like a you know, non-negative quantity. How about this one? Well, there's no randomness here, right? We've like deterministically picked the coordinate that has the smallest cost. So we're subtracting off the value of the coordinate with the smallest cost. Oh, we're, we're starting with the coordinate with the smallest cost. And we're subtracting off the cost of some other coordinate, which is not, you know, might be tied, but can't be smaller by definition of I star of C. So this term, it could be zero or it could be negative, but it cannot be positive. Okay, so we've got the product of like a, you know, non-negative term with a non-positive term. And the result is non-positive, it's at most zero. Okay, so this is saying, if the adversary plays C, we play deterministically I star of C, that particular combination of actions gives us payoff zero. So no matter what they play, if we best respond to it, the payoff is at most zero. We could have played I star of C. Okay, makes sense. Sort of, um, you know, when the adversary goes first, the algorithm design problem goes away. That's like 
the beauty of the min-max theorem. When the adversary goes first, you don't have to think about what to do. Like, just play the best action. The adversary has already told you what the payoffs are for the actions are. OK, so um, you know, in some sense, this statement is completely obvious, right? Like, the adversary tells you the payoff of each of your actions. Pick the one with the highest payoff. Sort of the magic is in the invocation of the min-max theorem, right? We've already proven the min-max theorem, so the next step is immediate. But you know, it it's still worth like reflecting on the magic every time you invoke the spell. Yeah. Well, most straightforwardly, it just means that the value of the game according to this payoff function is non-positive. But we did strategically define the utility function of this game to be proportional to the increase in the surrogate loss. So the fact, like, the reason why it is interesting that the value of this game is zero is that what that means is that there's a, you know, what what's the, what it's going to mean at least after we apply the min-max theorem is that there's going to be a distribution that the learner can play that guarantees the value, you know, guarantees payoff zero in this game, which in particular is going to guarantee that the increase in surrogate loss is very small, no matter what the adversary does. That's why, that's how this connects to what we're doing. Not quite zero, because remember, there's this constant term that we've left off. The, 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 incre the upper bound we proved on the increase in surrogate loss was this plus like an additional term that was like eta squared times the surrogate loss so far. The increase in surrogate loss is not going to be zero. That's why we're not going to get a regret bound of zero. Um, but it does mean that it's going to be small. OK. OK. So next, we apply the minimax theorem. OK, and just to remember, what do we need to apply the minimax theorem? We need a, a zero-sum game in which the action space of both players is convex and compact. We've got that. We need a utility function that is um, convex in the minimization player's actions, concave in the maximization player's actions. We've got one in which the utility function is linear in both players' actions, so in particular, concave and convex. The minimax theorem applies. Everything's bounded. And so, um, you know, like directly, since we have a bound on the max min value of the game, we also have a bound on the min max value of the game. Okay, I can just swap the max and the min. The minimum over the learner's actions of the maximum. Over the, over the adversary's actions of the utility when the adversary plays C and the learner plays P, well, it's equal to the min-max value. I just, it's equal to the max-min value, which we just bounded as zero. OK? And, and this is, you know, like, I don't even need to write down the proof. It's like the application of the min-max theorem. At this point, like, you know, just applying the theorem, it's just a, you know, mechanical algebraic operation, swapping the min and the max. But like, just reflect on the magic that's happening here. The statement we made in this lemma was sort of so obvious as to border on trivial. It sort of says, you know, like, how well can you do if your job is to pick the lowest cost action and the adversary tells you ahead of time the cost of every action? But we said, well, what was the proof saying? I mean, it was like, well, look at the, you know, look at what the adversary told you. Pick the one that has the lowest cost and play that. You've got the lowest cost action. Okay, very right, like brain dead, like obvious statement. What is this one saying? This one is saying there's a distribution the learner can play, okay, as a function of everything that's happened so far, because the softmax surrogate game is defined in terms of the transcript. So it's saying no matter what has happened so far, right, for any transcript, because this is true for any softmax surrogate game. There's a distribution of reactions that the learner can play so that no matter what the adversary does, the expected increase 
in this softmax surrogate, ignoring the constant term for now, is zero. This is very, very close to saying, since the softmax surrogate upper bounds regret, you know, just a couple of like algebraic steps that remain, that there exists a no regret learning algorithm. Okay? Not clear what it is. Right? This is an existential statement. You know, if you solve this min-max problem, right, if you find the best algorithm, you will get this regret guarantee. Okay, but like I just want to like pause, right, right? Like algebraically, like the min-max theorem is sort of the least interesting step here. Like we're, you know, I'm not we're not writing down any algebra. It's you know, like you've got like a min and a max before, and then you just like swap them. But like this is where it's all happening. Like we went from an algorithmically trivial statement to an existential claim about the existence of an algorithm that does something kind of cool. I mean, we already know because we've like been taking this class that there are algorithms that have this guarantee, but like we could have we could have started with this argument, right? This is proving the existence of such algorithms. We didn't have to start with the having algorithm and these potential arguments and stuff. We could have started with this and gotten the existence of no regret algorithms essentially in this step. Okay? So just a moment of Respect for the min-max theorem before we continue. Questions? Okay. Okay. So let's let's now make this explicit. Right. So the claim is now we have a proposed no regret algorithm. I'm going to write down like version one of it, and then we're going to iteratively simplify it to version two and version three. But version one is just at every round, given what's happened so far, given a transcript of what's happened so far, write down this game and solve it. Play the equilibrium strategy of this game. That is the no regret learning algorithm. We have a minimax sequential decision making algorithm. And what is it? Well, iteratively, for t equals one to capital T, step one construct. The round T soft max surrogate game, which depends on, of course, the transcript of what's happened so far. Right? The transcript shows up in the objective function. We need to compute these regrets and so on to compute the numbers that appear in the utility function. But we have all of that at round T. Okay, so compute, you know, just write down this game. And then just play a min-max strategy of this game, right? You need to pick a distribution on actions each day if you're a sequential decision maker. So, you know, just play a distribution on actions. This has the property that the maximum overall cost vectors that the adversary might pick of the utility function of this softmax surrogate game is at most zero. Okay, like we know such a thing exists. We just analyze the game, the min-max value of the game. Um, pick any such one. Okay, so this is just saying write down the game as it as it is defined at round t, ignoring what's happened so far except through the transcript used to define the game. And then play a min-max strategy for that game. Okay. And that's it. That's the algorithm. Okay. okay. And now I want to prove that this algorithm has a really good regret bound. In fact, the same regret bound, not so coincidentally, that we proved for multiplicative weights, like exactly the same regret bound.
So here's the theorem. Against any sequence of cost vectors, this algorithm this algorithm um, has regret that we can bound as well it's First of all, the regrets are random variables since there's randomness here. So let's talk about the expected regret in expectation over the transcript. Um, the regret of this algorithm is at most log of k over eta plus t times eta. Eta, remember, is this parameter that shows up in our softmax surrogate function. And um, you know we get to pick eta, right? So we might as well pick eta to minimize this expression. And so if we, you know, say happen to pick eta to be the square root of log k over t, then what we'll get is that. This is at most two root t log of k. OK, if this looks familiar, this is exactly the regret bounds we proved for multiplicative weights. OK, except now, like, right, like how did we get to multiplicative weights? We started with like the halving algorithm. We were like analyzing this potential function, the sum of the weights. We sort of did this using ad hoc techniques. Here, somehow, we're analyzing an algorithm that just says, you know, every day play the equilibrium strategy of that game. Okay, so let's like figure out how to prove the bound this way. OK. So the theorem is about regret. We want to bound regret. Now remember, the whole conceit of this analysis was that we weren't going to directly bound regret. We were going to bound this softmax surrogate for regret and then bound the regret using the softmax surrogate. OK, so let's follow through on that plan. So the first thing we're going to do is upper bound the softmax surrogate. Once we've done that, then we can upper bound regret. So let's think about, you know, here we are at round S. Maybe what's happened already in the first S minus one rounds, that's done. Okay. Given what's happened, I want to upper bound in expectation what the softmax surrogate loss is going to be at the end of round S. Okay. So that is to say, I want to bound The expected value over what randomness? Well, the randomness of the learner's strategy at round s of the softmax surrogate loss at round s, conditional on the transcript that's been realized for the first s minus one rounds. Okay, fixing everything else over the only remaining source of randomness, which is the learner's randomness at round s. What is the expected value of the softmax surrogate at the next round? OK. Well, um, you know, definitionally, because we define this object equal to the one round increase in softmax surrogate loss, definitionally, this is equal to um, the loss up through round s minus 1. This thing is not a random variable. This thing is fixed once we fix the transcript, the loss we've seen so far. And so 
where's the randomness? Well, the randomness is governing how much this loss increases from round S minus one to round S. Okay, so plus the expectation over the choice of action drawn from the learner's strategy here of the one round increase, the difference between the loss at round S and the loss at round S minus one, the one round increase given the transcript that's been realized so far um, of the cost vector chosen by the adversary at round S. We don't know what that is yet. It's got all, the statement has to hold for all such cost vectors. Uh, and the action chosen by the learner. This thing is the, that's where the randomness is. The learner is choosing a random action from this distribution. Okay, so this is like, basically just unrolling the definition of delta, right? Delta is the difference between the loss at round S and the loss at round S minus one. Okay. Now, this is a quantity we understand, at least we've proven an upper bound on it. We know an upper bound on this quantity, so we can upper bound this expression. This is at most. Let's remember what this upper bound looked like. Part of the upper bound was written here. Part of the upper bound was what we used to define this utility function and the zero sum game here. But there was another part of the upper bound that was a, just a constant. It didn't depend on the actions of the learner and the adversary. And so we left it out of this utility function because it didn't matter. But we need to remember it now. What was that other part of the upper bound? It was eta squared times the loss at round s minus one. Now, we already have a term in this expression corresponding to the loss at round s minus one. Okay, so we're gonna, we have that, and now we're getting like another eta squared copies of it. Okay, so applying our upper bound on delta, we get, well, one plus eta squared times the loss at round s minus one. The, the one came from here, and the eta squared came from the upper bound we proved on delta. Plus, well, the expectation over the action chosen by the learner of the remaining part of this upper bound. That's exactly this expression here. OK, so the additional term we have here is the utility function evaluated at the cost vector chosen by the adversary at round s and the distribution chosen by the learner at round s. Okay, this is again just unrolling our upper bound on the increase in loss. There was this constant eta squared times the loss at round s minus one term. And what was the rest of it? It was, it was this, it was the expectation over the action chosen by the learner of the sum over all of the actions of e to the regret to that action times eta times ci minus cj, which very intentionally we encapsulated as the utility function in this game. Okay, and so we can upper bound the one round increase in loss by one plus eta squared times the existing loss plus the value of the objective function in the game we just defined. But PS, the distribution chosen by the learner at this round is chosen to be a min-max strategy. Okay, a strategy that guarantees that no matter what the cost vector is, it guarantees for the maximum overall cost vectors. And so in particular, guarantees for the cost vector chosen by the adversary, that this expression is non-positive. Okay, this thing's gonna be less than or equal to zero. So because the algorithm, you know, is explicitly playing a min-max strategy, um, well, this is at most one plus eta squared times the loss of you know, the loss at round s minus one. Okay, so um, you know originally we had you know a potentially complicated expression. Even our linear upper bound on this thing was you know long and painful to write out, but um, 
you know, because we we put sort of the long part of it in this zero sum game that turns out to have value zero, it goes away entirely. And the increase in surrogate loss, the expected surrogate loss at round S, given what we have already experienced at round S minus one, is just a multiplicative factor of one plus eta squared times the loss that we've experienced at round S minus one. And that's it. Okay, so if we play according to this algorithm, what's going to happen is that the surrogate loss is sort of going to increase geometrically uh, based, you know, every time it's going to be multiplied by a factor of one plus eta squared. It's going to evolve in a very easy to understand way. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so what we have so far is a bound on how much multiplicatively the surrogate loss increases from one round to the next. So we want a, a final upper bound on this thing. So like, we should, you know, it's going to be like a, an induction kind of argument. So what was the surrogate loss at round, z uh, round zero at the very beginning? Well, remember, what's the surrogate loss? It's the sum over all of the actions of e to the regret to that action. Initially, the regret to each of the actions is zero. We haven't done anything. Okay, you have no regret. E to the zero is one. And we're summing up over k actions. So initially, at round zero, the surrogate loss was k. Okay, it started at value k. Um, it started at value k, and in expectation, every round that increased by a multiplicative factor of one plus eta squared. So just you know, unrolling that argument, applying that bound at step one, and then step two, and then step three, and then step four, what do we get? Well, we get you know since the loss at round zero was k. In expectation over the whole transcript, the loss at round t is, well, started at k. And for each of t rounds, it increased by a multiplicative factor of 1 plus eta squared. And so in total, it increased by a factor of 1 plus eta squared to the t. This is, um, at most, k times e to the t eta squared, because 1 plus eta squared is less than or equal to e to the eta squared. And if we raise e to the eta squared to the t power, the next exponent comes inside and multiplies what was there already. OK. Now, this is a bound on the surrogate loss. The surrogate loss is not the thing that we necessarily care about. We care about the regret. Okay. So, but but you know we know how the surrogate loss upper bounds the regret, and so let's just pull on that thread. What do we know? The thing we're really getting at here. The thing we're really getting at is an expectation over the transcript. What is the regret of the algorithm? Well, the first thing we proved about this surrogate loss is that the regret is upper bounded by 1 over eta times log of the surrogate loss. OK, so this is the expected regret is at most um, 1 over eta times the expected value of the log of the surrogate loss. OK. Now, what, is a, what does a logarithm look like? It kind of looks like this, right? It's concave, because that's what a cave looks like. And so. We have to make sure we're applying Jensen's inequality in the right direction. 
we have an expectation of a log. The log is this sort of concave looking function. An expectation is an average. So we're averaging evaluations of the log. The average of this evaluation will lie below a concave curve. Uh, and so if instead of took if, if instead of taking the expectation of a log, we took a log of an expectation, we took the average and evaluated the function at that average, that would give us something only bigger. The evaluation of a concave function at an average is only bigger than the average of its evaluations. Okay, so here we've got an expectation of a log, but this is only smaller than now the log of the expectation by Jensen's inequality. So it's only smaller than the log of the expected surrogate loss. Now the expected surrogate loss is the thing we just bounded. Okay. Okay. In fact, okay. Bounded it by this. So the log of this is easy to take, right? It's like log k plus t eta squared. So, um, you know, what's one over eta that? Well, it's at most log k over eta plus t eta squared over eta, that's t eta. Okay, and that was the regret bound we set up. Okay, so th this is. Like, what do we have so far? We've proven by, you know, like a very different method, the invocation of the min-max theorem, the same regret bound up to constants as we proved for the multiplicative weights mechanism. Now, the algorithm itself so far looks quite different. It's saying every round, write down this game, solve for the min-max strategy, play that. It doesn't look like the multiplicative weights mechanism. Um, okay, but maybe it does. Okay, so, so so far we've proven a regret bound for an algorithm that is sort of just using the min-max theorem basically existentially. It's saying we, we, we bounded the max-min value of the game. That was easy. So we'll just play a min-max value of the game. Now I want to understand what the min-max, what a min-max strategy looks like in this game we've defined. Do we have to solve for it numerically or or can we understand it enough um, so that we can get a closed form for it. Okay. And we can. Um, I'm going to tell you like a closed form, but I don't want it to be like totally mysterious. So let's, let, let's like stare at this utility function and see if we can get some intuition for where it might come from. <laughs> like, basically, I want to exploit the symmetry of this thing. So what is an expectation? An expectation is just a sum. Right? It's a weighted sum. It's the, it's the, you know, here we're taking the expectation over the action's i. That's just saying we're summing over the action's i, weighting by the probability that we play that action. Okay, so we've got two sums out here, a sum over i and a sum over j. There's a term in this sum that is sort of like the weight corresponding to the sum over j. Right? There's a weight corresponding to j. The weight over i is pi. It's the weight of our strategy. We get to decide the weight over i. The game has told us what the weight is for j. And then what do we have? We have this symmetric expression. Ci minus Cj treats i and j symmetrically. So if we can choose our weights so that the whole expression is sort of symmetric in i and j, um, you know, like zero is going to be like the only possible value this can take, right? Because you know, i is you know has weight one, but j has weight minus one. So, you know, any positive weight would be canceled out by exactly the same negative weight. Right? So, so if, we can dis if we can choose a distribution over our own actions 
such that this expression is symmetric in i and j, except for the sign, then it'll take value 0 for any c. And that's what we want to do, because we that's exactly what we want. We want a distribution p such that for every c, this thing takes value at most 0. We'd settle for exactly 0, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, so that's another intuition in general for solving zero sum games. You know, if if my opponent is strictly opposed, it has strictly opposite interests to me, then you know, what are they gonna do given their options? They're gonna pick like the one that's best for them, which is the one that's worst for me. So, you know, like in general, if I have you know, functions with, you know, like linear functions with different slopes. And I know someone's going to pick the one that's worst for me, the one that has highest value, and I want to minimize the maximum. What should I do? I should arrange things so that they are indifferent between the two of them. So that's sort of another intuition. I want to come up with a distribution over actions so that my opponent, who's choosing the cost vector, is indifferent between all cost vectors. That's the idea. And so that's why I'm going to tell you the minimax strategy. Um, this is how you could have come up with it yourself. Let's define a, a concrete distribution over actions. Let's let PT be some distribution over actions. Defined as follows. What's the weight that we put on action I? Well, it's going to be up to some normalization term that I'll write down in a moment. Just the exponential of eta times the regret that I have as of today, to action i. And what's this normalization term? It's just the thing it's got to be so that these weights sum to 1, so that they're a probability distribution. So the normalization term is just the sum of these weights over all of the terms. OK, so if I just divide by this normalization term, I have a probability distribution. These are non-negative quantities that sum to 1. And um, you know, the dilemma is that for all vectors that the adversary might choose, in particular for the maximum over them, The utility that we get when we plug in the adversary's cost vector C and we plug in this distribution PT, um, it's at most zero. Okay, so, so it is a min-max strategy for this game. Okay, so we you know we don't need to like numerically solve the game. Like we can just use this explicit distribution. We measure what is our regret to each action so far, and we play each action in proportion to the exponential of our regret. Yeah. That's right. So, although, as it, hap as it happens, yeah, we didn't prove the other direction, but the value of this game is exactly zero. The adversary can also guarantee if they go, you know, 
first or second that you get payoff zero for, or they could have just picked the all zeros vector. So the fact that it's upper bounded by zero means it is a min max strategy. Yeah, so, so yeah, that's right. In principle, we only want that it's at most zero, but it happens. The only way you can get that is, is by applying a min max strategy. So, so, so the upshot is that this is in closed form a min max equilibrium strategy for the surrogate game. Okay. That's right, up to details of, you know, like we chose this particular surrogate loss, but, but once we chose the surrogate loss, this is what you have to do. Okay, this is like, yeah, so, so like essentially what is multiplicative weights? Multiplicative weights is the min-max equilibrium strategy of this surrogate game. You can define other surrogate games which give you different min-max equilibrium strategies and you can go through this exercise and derive things like gradient descent in this manner, the equilibrium strategy for a different surrogate game. Um, but so, yeah, in some sense, that is what multiplicative weights is. Okay. Okay, so the claim is, right, like this is a min-max equilibrium strategy. So we had this algorithm for which we proved, you know, maybe a little bit less mysteriously now, exactly the regret bounds we proved for multiplicative weights. But it just said, you know, at each round, like play a min-max equilibrium strategy of that abstract game over there. Now we can replace it with play this distribution in closed form. Okay. And um, why does that work? So we need to prove what we claimed here. We need to prove that in the worst case over the choice of C, or equivalently for any choice of C, the utility function, this thing, when we plug in C and our particular closed form choice of weights, evaluates to at most zero. So what is this utility function? When we plug in PT. Well, it's an expectation over the choice of action. What's an expectation over the choice of action? It's the sum over all of the actions of the weight of, of the probability of playing that action times the thing inside the expectation operator. Okay, so we can write that as the sum over all of the actions of, well, the weight of that action times the thing inside the expectation operator, which is the sum over all of the actions again of e to the eta times the regret to action j of eta times ci minus cj. Now we have a particular closed form for PIT. So we can write it out. It's just one over the normalization constant of the sum over all of the actions i chosen by the learner, of the sum over all of the actions j that the learner might have regret to, of pi, well, what's pi? Up to the normalization term, it's just e to the eta times the regret to i. What's the weight we have 
already on action J? Well, it's exactly the same expression, except in terms of the regret to action J. E to the eta times the regret to J of eta times Ci minus Cj. OK, so now we've got um, the symmetry. We've got sort of a double sum. And we've got you know this e to the regret to i term and this e to the regret to j term, but you know these sums you know like we could rename i and j. And we've got this difference here, c i minus c j. So just to make it explicit, let's expand out this difference. What do we have? Well, we can bring this eta all the way out. We've got eta over 5t times the sum over i times the sum over j of e to the eta times the regret to i times e to the eta times the regret to j times ci. OK, that's like the first term here. Minus the second term, which looks very, very similar, which is also eta over phi t of the sum over i, sum over j, e to the eta times the regret to i, e to the eta times the regret to j times cj. OK, we just expanded out the ci minus cj term. But the first expression is exactly equal to the same to the second expression up to renaming the variables i and j, right? Like in the second expression, if I just call, if I rename variable i as j and I rename variable j as i, then the second double sum is exactly the same as the first double sum. They're the same up to labeling. So they're the same sum. And so this is equal to 0. That's it. OK, so the, you know, in some sense, like the way we computed the closed form min-max strategy here is by exploiting symmetry, symmetry of this objective function. OK, we won't always have nice closed forms for min-max equilibrium strategies, but like in this case, our utility function was nice and symmetric, and so we do. OK. Um, maybe one more simplification. Because this is you know, already starting to remind you a lot of multiplicative weights, but like maybe it's not quite there yet. Like multiplicative weights, first of all, has this sort of one round iterative update. We sort of update the weights one at a time. And it's not discounting every action according to its regret. It's discounting every action according to its loss, which is not exactly the same thing. OK, so this is already like multiplicative weights-esque, but like maybe we're not quite there yet in, in having like derived like the same algorithm. OK, but maybe we just have to like squint to like get there. OK, so let me rewrite the algorithm one more time. And it's not quite multiplicative weights as we defined it. So, so this one I'm going to call exponential weights. But this is another algorithm that you'll find, you know, like in the literature derived from first principles. And it's extremely similar. So this is the exponential weights algorithm. OK, and this is going to look like the algorithms we derived from first principles at the beginning, like where everything gets a weight. You know, we play each action proportional to the weights. We update the weights in sort of this local manner. So for each of the k actions, let's set 
the weight of that action initially to be one and the cumulative weight to be equal to the sum of the individual weights, so initially k. Then at each round, let's play the following distribution. where we play each action with probability proportional to its weight. Okay, this is exactly what we were doing in the halving algorithm and the multiplicative weights algorithm and so forth. And then how do we update the weights? Well, we observe the costs. And then for expert I, its weight is set to be what its weight was yesterday, but now discounted by e to the minus eta times the cost that was experienced today, and we'll update the normalization term to just again be the sum of the individual expert weights. OK, so this is the exponential weights algorithm. This is now exactly in the form that we sort of derived our algorithms from first principles. Every expert gets a weight. Uh, we play each expert with probability proportional to its weight. And we sort of discount the weights of the experts in probability sort of proportional to the cost they experience. Not the regret. There's no regret here. We're just looking at the costs. and. Uh, you know, decreasing the weight for experts that have high cost. Okay, so this is line by line the same as the multiplicative weights algorithm as we derived it, except in the multiplicative weights algorithm, we you, we sort of discounted here by a factor of one minus eta times the cost. Here we're just using a, a slightly different approximation, e to the minus eta times the cost, right? So the one difference is when we derive this from first principles, we said one minus eta times the cost. Here it's e to the minus eta times the cost. We could have done this in our first principles derivation as well. Okay. And the claim is that the regret bound that we proved for the minimax algorithm applies to this algorithm too. This is implementing the minimax algorithm. Okay, so you know, step one was just literally saying play the minimax equilibrium strategy. Step two was saying play this strategy. Here's a closed form for the minimax equilibrium strategy. Step three is saying this algorithm is also playing a minimax equilibrium strategy. This algorithm is actually implicitly playing according to this distribution. Okay, and that's why it gets the regret bound. It's the same algorithm, just in a different form. Okay, so the lemma, just to like establish that final fact, is that, you know, maybe so that this lemma makes more notational sense, let's say that the distribution we play here is called QT. The lemma is that for all t, qt, the distribution played by this algorithm, equals pt, the distribution we proved to be a minimax strategy. Okay, so first of all, like let's just write out what PT or what QT is. Okay, QT here we've sort of defined it implicitly by these like one round updates, but it's not hard to figure out what it is because 
you know, at the first round, the weights were one. And then at every round, would we multiply the weight for expert I by e to the eta times the cost for expert I? So um, what are we calling these things? QT, so like Q um, TI is just up to this normalization factor, one over WT is uh, just e to the minus eta times the sum from all of the rounds from 1 through t minus 1 of the cost of expert i in that round, because we're discounting by the cost of these experts, which is a little bit different than what pt is, which is the sum of the regrets at each round. But, you know, if we look at PT, well, it's, well, in the numerator, it's e to the eta times the regret to action i. What's the regret to action i? It's the sum over all of the um, round so far of the cost experienced by the algorithm minus the cost experienced by expert I divided by this normalization term, which is just the sum over all J of, well, the regret to expert J. So the, you know, e to the eta times the sum over all of the rounds of the cost of the algorithm minus the cost of expert J at each of those rounds. But we've got this difference in both the numerator and the denominator. And so we can factor this as e to the eta times the cost the algorithm times e to the minus eta times the cost of expert i in the numerator and also in the denominator as the sum over all of the experts of e to the eta times the cumulative cost of the algorithm times e to the minus eta of the cumulative cost of expert J. And the cumulative cost of the algorithm shows up both in the numerator and the denominator. And what we're left with is exactly the distribution played by this algorithm. So the difference between discounting according to the regret and discounting according to the cost doesn't matter at all, because the regret is just the difference between what the algorithm does at each round on the cost of each action, and and that's the same in every term, and so it can't. Okay. Long story short, we derived exponential weights from first principles using the minimax theorem. I'll see you guys next.